So welcome to the stream. I'm Frank Boucher, your host, and for the next one hour and a half, we'll be with Antoni Bartolo. We'll be talking about what you will be talking about, Anton. A lot of crazy things. Um, I used to be part of a team of engineers that would go out and test out services that Microsoft's going to launch on Azure uh, prior to it coming to fruition. And it was a lot of partnering with companies, like you know, organizations outside of Microsoft, uh, in terms of the adoption of uh, said technologies. Uh, and one of the stories we'll be talking about today is how we used um, artificial intelligence, so specifically custom vision AI, uh, to understand what life jackets look like when they're, when people are in the water and they're in distress. Um, there was a lot of work done around that project, so it is one of the uh, bigger projects that we'll be talking about today. But what I'll be sharing uh, amidst all the projects that we'll be talking about is not only how it was built and uh, how the solution came to be, um, but also the codes, uh, or the, the, the code itself, the codes. The code itself, uh, I'll be sharing the GitHub repos for all the code uh, that was created so that you can, yeah, exactly, so you can replicate <laughs> and you can test. Um, and the reason why we do that is because, you know, the projects that we, we completed were done in such a way that we made the code open source for others to take advantage of. Now, of all the code that's out there, obviously there is no um, you know, prohibited code or um, uh, code owning to an individual. So all the databases and everything have been wiped clean. It's just the architecture of the code itself that's being uh, offered up as open source. And it's done in such a way where you can plug and play it into other solutions. And I'll actually show a demo of how we take this drone solution for the, for the Canadian Coast Guard that we built uh, and how it's being applied into other solutions. And we'll actually walk through a demo of that as well. Excellent. So today is an open discussion. You, know, we'll, you will be sharing very soon your screen and we'll, we'll, we'll see that. But at any point yep. when people have questions, they could go type it in the chat. I will monitor yes. the chat because I know sometimes we can be focused in the code or whatever we're presenting. So we'll make sure to uh, forward any question to you. And if for some reason people cannot follow until the end or maybe the question pop in their head after, where is the best place to reach out to you? So you can get me on Twitter. Um, I'm at Wireless Life. Um, I know it's a moniker that people, where does that come from? It's, you know, I was part of the uh, mobile industry a long time ago. Uh, in Canada, we have a company called Rogers Communications. Uh, I was there for 10 years. And when I started out my career in tech, it was there. Uh, and so I was very fo much focused on wireless. And we'll talk a little bit actually in this presentation today. Um, so I've been on uh, Twitters for the longest time. Uh, that's probably the best place, but the whole team and there's the whole team that um, I work with uh, can be reached if you do the hashtag AZOps with your question. Uh, that will also allow you to ask questions of the team, not just myself. Uh, and then there's also the show that happens every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, which is the AZ Update show. Uh, Frank's laughing because I'm giving a plug for my show. On the, Twitch, on the Twitch stream. Uh, if you want to check that out, uh, there's also a, um, a blog post that we share every week with all the details in terms of what we shared on the show, uh, aka.ms forward slash uh, AZ Update Show. I think, Frank, you put all the URLs in the uh, in the, the show, show synopsis. Wait a for minute. Today. You're plugging your show. You're stooling <laughs> my, uh, my quote. Okay, bye, guys. <laughs> Bonjour, comment ça va? Je, je m'appelle Anton. No. You, you do French a lot better than I do. You know, it's my new but Francais, no, right? bien. Uh, si. So, yeah, yeah. So, if you're watching that on uh, video on demand, all the link will be in the description. And Twitch also will put that after the show. Everything will be there. And the Twitter handle will be displayed in a few seconds just as soon as we go uh, sharing your screen. Your yep. Twitter handle will be just under. And now that you plug your show, you need to invite me at your show so I could plug mine. <laughs> Definitely going to have you on the show. Um, we are the biggest challenge that we have right now is every the show is being put on with bandages and duct tape, uh, and it's like we have to time it in such a way so that the equipment that we're using lasts for the period of the show. Um, we've actually started to incorporate recorded uh, segments into the show right now, which um, we had Pumla. Um, uh, have a, a conversation with Shannon uh, Kunin about uh, uh, VMware on Azure, and uh, it worked really well. And so we're going to be doing more of that. Uh, so definitely open invitation for yourself to come on the show uh, with a recorded segment if you want to interview somebody, um, or you know if you have something that you want to show. And that's and that's you know every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern time that we have the show, and it's recorded for everybody to watch afterwards too. 
So let's let's go to your screen now. Okay. My little animation. <laughs> now you have your Twiddle under. Twiddle there you go. So there's my Twitter. Just under you. Yeah, Twitter handles there. Um, I also have the hashtag, uh, the blog that uh, we write for is itopsock.com. Uh, and then my GitHub repo, which has all my code source for everything that's made available as open source for all, all the projects I was participant, uh, participated in. Um, what I wanted to highlight first is in terms of technology, right? This, what I'm going to show you is not that long ago. It may date myself and Frank, because Frank's going to see a couple items in here and go, oh my God. Um, but this is something where, you know, not too long ago, this was computing, right? I would go to a destination. I would go to a desk. It would have this device connected. Commodore 64 bought a Canadian tire uh, for 150 bucks was my first computer. And you'd have to go to it. You'd have to turn it on. You wouldn't log in. You just, boom, here's the OS, the basic OS. Uh, load your application, pole position. I'm a car guy. That was probably one of my first favorite games that was available. Um, the mobile device was strictly a communication device. And, you know, to date myself in terms of how long I worked at Rogers, uh, the, the Zach Morris phone there was the, the, the Motorola 8000 brick phone. Uh, it would last six hours. It would store 30 numbers and it was only voice communication. Now the technology was a lot older, it was analog, what have you. So it did use a lot more battery. Um, but for portability and if you want to have longevity, you would have a car phone. Uh, as you can see below from the, the two individuals from, from uh, a television show from the 80s, uh, you had the phone plugged into the cigarette lighter uh, so that you would have all day communication. This was what technology was back then. And then this happened, right? And, and, you know, a lot of people say, no, it was the iPhone. I'm gonna argue tooth and nail that it was the BlackBerry. This was the first connected device that people would have in their hands and would receive email on a device. This, this device ran on a single AA battery. Uh, it would last three days. Um, it was on a proprietary network, uh, but the capabilities of just receiving email on your hip was so astronomical. People couldn't even fathom, you know, oh my God, this is amazing. I can read my emails from anywhere I go. And at that time, email was the biggest thing in terms of communication. There was instant messaging, but it hadn't really caught on as of yet. Um, so this was a big deal back then when it came out. Now, this is back in the 90s and early 2000s. And then we're way past that now, right? So, so in, in 2018, there were 7 billion IoT devices connected. IoT, as you know, Internet of Things is the new, uh, not even new, it's, it's been around for a while in respect to getting devices connected uh, to the cloud for, for you know, ingestion of data um, and uh, prediction of outcomes. And in, t in 2020, it's estimated that there's currently 32 billion devices connected. Now, what's interesting is that you don't really hear IoT devices anymore, you just hear devices because everything is being connected from refrigerators to light bulbs to cars. You know, what is a, what is a device being connected? It's, it's, it's everything. What are they doing? You know, it's all the information it's grabbing. It's all the, you know, understanding, you know, patterns and understanding, you know, even on the edge, giving the ability for that device that's capturing all this information to have the capability to even understand what it's looking at and then digesting that information and providing an, a result or an outcome back to the cloud as opposed to providing just the raw data. It's estimated by in 10 years time, we're looking at 80 billion devices connected. So that means, you know, everything is going to be connected. I've even heard of desks that are connected to the internet uh, or to the cloud to understand when an individual is sitting at the desk or not. And if that desk is not being used, why is it not, be, why is it not being used? And should it be assigned to somebody else because it's never being used? Like this is how crazy we've got in terms of connectivity. To add to that, with all these devices being connected, as mentioned, there's a there's with a all these devices being connected, data that's as mentioned, out there that's being made available. Um, Eighty percent of the world's data has been captured in the last two years. Eighty percent, and that's because of connected devices. That's because of connected individuals, um, mobile devices that are connected. You know, we have computers in our hands. I can connect with my. Uh, mobile device, I have an Android device, I can connect to the internet, I can connect to my Azure portal, I can stop and start services, I can, you know, if I wanted to, I can roll out my Bluetooth keyboard and I can code away um, from my device. Um, the whole availability of, you know, being trapped on the machine or being trapped at a computer, not even a laptop, you, you can do it pretty much anywhere and it's, and it's crazy. Um, but it is, you know, ushering in a new era in terms of what do we do with all this data. And one of the conversations I have quite frequently is, hey, I have all this data that's coming in. I want to plug it into AI. I want to either A, 
make more money by predicting X or B, save money by predicting X. And it's interesting because the fact that, you know, a lot of people that come to me is like, I just want to rub AI on my business. And I know it's going to make me money or I'm going to, I'm going to rub AI on my business. And I know it's going to save me that money. People and it, say that. It, it, it happens a lot, right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. how do I how, how do I adopt AI to like do that. this? Yeah. Right. How do I adopt AI to save money? How do I adopt AI to to make more money? I want to, you know, predict this. I want to predict that. And it's like, well, what are you trying to accomplish? Like the fact that you just want to make money doesn't really fly. You gotta you gotta be able to do something with it. You wanna you wanna be able to build upon it, right? Solve the first problem or solve or address the first opportunity. And then from there build to something else and build to something else. And and that's you know my first story that I'm gonna share right now. We sat down with the uh, Missing Children's Society of Canada. This is a team of 17 people that handle all the missing children cases from across Canada to you know assist in when uh, a child is reported missing. Um, they immediately get a report to say, okay, this child has been you know reported missing. Uh, can you help us with the investigation work to find out you know what had happened with the child, who they were in contact with, um, you know maybe the, the patterns of where they travel and all that. And they had come to us. Uh, at Microsoft with a, with, a, with an ask to say, hey, can you help us? Everything that we do right now is manual. We would love for a way just to capture the data uh, in a digitalized format so that, you know, they wanted us to build out a portal so that the law enforcement can go in and type in all the information to automate the process of capturing the information. And we said, let's take it a step further. What is the biggest challenge? Like, so if you're digitalizing all your information, what are you actually trying to accomplish? And their response was, you know, when a child is reported missing, it takes us up to 30 days worth of research to find out, you know, who the child was in contact with, the sentiment of the conversation, their travel patterns from around the, the districts that they live in, um, their communication patterns, you know, all that information. We have to do that all manually. So, you know, digitalizing the, the input or the capture of these children being reported miss, missing would help out a great deal. And I, we, you know, responded back and said, how about if we automated the process that allowed us, allowed you to capture the information itself? So that you can build out this dossier in, you know, instead of 30 days, maybe a couple hours. And they were like, could you do that? And like, of course, like, yeah. right. It's a big game changer in terms of, of, of finding kids. So this is the only GitHub repo that I'm going to have that's different. Uh, it's aka.ms forward slash HFM. Uh, HFM stands for help find me. And that's actually the moniker that we used uh, in regards to this solution. It was The solution was called the Child Finder Bot. And what we actually did, and this was, you know, give me just two seconds, and we'll change. We'll we'll go in the corner. Okay. Since I'm feeling I'm hiding stuff. There it is. <laughs> oh no, I'm hiding the uh, the repo. It doesn't work. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can we can share the repo again in the in the URL. It, it's okay. But here, like, oh, so we'll this is the that. only Sorry. slide. Continue. We'll... No, no, it's it's fine. We can we can add it to the to the to the description afterwards, right? I think yeah, it's the only yeah, one. Yeah, I can... well, we'll type it in the chat. So just continue. Perfect. So in this scenario here, um, this is what we did, right? So the challenges that they had was they would receive the information man manually from the law enforcement, and then they would go forward and do the research online to capture all the information on the child. What we've done is we've built out a solution that allows Missing Children Society of Canada to automate the process in terms of understanding the communication patterns, uh, as well as the travel patterns online. What happens is the child registers for the service, uh, when they, uh, if the child can't register for the service and the parents would register for the service completely free, there's a portal that you would go to. Uh, and once they registered for the service, they would connect in their Facebook account, Instagram account, Twitter account. And then we even, we've even left open like a, a future t uh, triggers. Uh, so if there's, you know, so right now we have uh, TikTok is hot. Uh, and so if the API exists that so we can extract information from TikTok, then we can have that capability as well. Back then there was no TikTok when the solution was built out, but we did provide the capability to have additional social media platforms plugged in uh, or made available when you know other platforms became popular to add into the solution. So you had this webhook that would go in and would extract information on the child. So what would it extract? Um, you know, you can actually get GPS coordinates uh, if the child is using their mobile device, even if the GPS is turned off, it will tell us in terms of geographical region where the internet connection for that device took place. Um, and so we we'll capture that information. We we'll capture who is the child in conversation with. Uh, and so, you know, give us a list of all the individuals that they're talking to. But better yet, we actually use uh, uh, cognitive services sentiment analysis based on the text that was inputted from the social media account to understand 
happy, sad, romantic intention, you know, uh, angry. What was the sentiment of the conversations with the individuals that we're speaking to? And this was all done via Azure Functions. Now, this was prior to all the other things that went on uh, in terms of the uh, Facebook getting in trouble or Cambridge uh, getting in trouble with regards to the extraction of data. Um, now, what we have, you know, this solution is still running, uh, but back then the APIs were wide open. They've obviously shut them down uh, thus uh, because of what occurred back then. And so in this situation here, what we now have is if you wanted to deploy this, if you wanted to do a similar solution, there is actually a process that you have to go through with each social media platform. Uh, obviously, Facebook and Instagram would be at the same time, but you have the ability to still have this type of functionality in terms of capturing of information um, in respect to you know uh, doing a sentiment analysis on the conversations that are taking place. It would require specific permission from the social media platforms, and you would have to provide them a, a, a business case as to why you're capturing this information. Uh, luckily, when we built out this solution, uh, it was in partnership with Missing Children's Society of Canada and the Royal Canadian Mountain Police. And because we had that backing, obviously, the social media platforms had no issue with us continuing forward with the solution. Um, but like I said, this solution, what it did was it made the availability to understand the conversations that were happening between the child and those on social media. 90% of the abductions happen because of romantic intent. It's, hey, I like you. I like the way that, you know, we're having this conversation. I'd like to meet up with you. Uh, here's a place that we can meet. And that's the dangerous piece about this. And so it's understanding when that occurs, the probability of, you know, this individual could be uh, somebody that, you know, this child shouldn't be talking to and we'll have to investigate further. Now, what I actually wanted to do was I actually wanted to showcase how easy it is to implement, to implement a sentiment analysis, not only on social media, but on any, you know, documentation or even a, a web call out to a specific page. Or, you know, if you have a blog and you have comments uh, that come out on the blog, you can actually go through and do sentiment analysis on the comments. I know sometimes, you know, some individuals get a, a bit heated and, you know, put negative comments on. Uh, and if there are comments that shouldn't be on your blog, you can actually automate the functionality of removing those comments uh, using using a combination of Azure Functions and uh, uh, sentiment analysis or cognitive services sentiment analysis. And one of the questions I get a lot, and Frank, correct me if you know, um, correct me if I'm wrong, or if this is a question that you get a lot, is well, great, Anthony, you know, I, I can do all this, but, you know, there's a cost involved. And I, you know, I'm a student or I'm a small business and, you know, I, I, I don't have a developer on staff. Um, how do I do this? How do I test this? How do I learn? And, you know, I just want to learn the functionality. I'm not going to pay for uh, learning the functionality. You know, how does Microsoft offer that up in terms of learning? And well, yeah, for all oh, the, like any, any AI, like people are aware, always worried that it will be complex that will take forever to implement and and stuff like that you're right on that. it comes up a lot right we, we hear that a lot um it, it's something where microsoft has struggled for a long time to make it easier um and that's why i don't know if you know obviously frank you're familiar but i don't know if the audience is familiar microsoft learn if you haven't tried it out if you haven't checked it out yet do so uh and i'm actually going to show you a demo of why you need to check it out um here we go here. So here is a lab on Microsoft Learn. This lab specifically calls text analytics, the API from a testing console. This lab is completely free. This gives you the availability to go forward in the sandbox technology and test out text analytics, the text analytics API for the functionality of analysis, analysis of a document called up in a browser uh, to have an understanding of the sentiment that's occurring with this document. And I'm going to show you how easy it is to set up. Um, this is done in what we call sandbox technology. So the lab that you see on the one side you know, provides you all the steps on how to, how to uh, reproduce this. But the actual um, uh, solution itself, as you can see on the other side, it is all uh, click-based. So once I've gone in and I've selected sentiment for my, for my analysis, I'm literally going to select my region, which is East U.S., and all I have to do now is I have to add in my subscription key. The Microsoft Learn solution in Sandbox actually gives you the key for free. Obviously, it's on a free tier, so that's you know it's going to be very rudimentary analysis. But it's the availability to actually put forward the the um, the key uh, specific to this for free. And then once you've entered in that key, and actually I just got to do something really quickly. Where's my key? Oop. No. Password one two three. Yes. Isn't that always? <laughs> isn't that always the key? I'm gonna copy. Ah. Don't do that. Copy that. 
One second here. And we'll go back to my screen. And we'll go back to my desktop number two. And there we go. So obviously it's not going to be that difficult, but I'll put in my key. There we go. And I'll send. And it'll test my it'll test my connection in respect to, you know, is this what you want to pull? Here's the documents that you uh, that you've loaded in in Wait. terms of capturing that sentiment. Yep. Let's go in the. Is it so right now we are both in the top right corner. Is it better? You think we'll we'll be adding less stuff? Oh, it's fine. It's, it's so this this uh, I just wanted to show really quickly in terms of the code that's made available and what in the HTTP request that you're putting forward. You're not really hiding anything if we're both in the top right corner. It's it's okay. I'm just trying um, but, to to be in a place where like yeah, because I know. we were both I in apologize. the lower corner, and you are showing uh, stuff in inside the lower yeah, corner. Yeah, no, it's it, it's better it's better to keep us in the higher corner okay. only because it'll, it'll show the um the response in the lower corner, uh, in terms of the the test scores that are put that are put forward. Perfect. So these documents are preloaded from the lab itself. Obviously, these are not you know documents that I've submitted. Um, so obviously you're, it's going to, you know, if you're testing and learning out the functionality, um, it's something where it's, it's sandboxed and it's a trial that you're going through. Uh, but this is completely free. You don't even need an Azure account to test this out. Um, you can go for it and you can actually copy, uh, the request in terms of the, you know, to take it into your visual studio code to start playing with and dabbling with and, and making changes to, um, obviously you would have to change the subscription key. So once you're more comfortable. Uh, in terms of the labs that you've completed, you can go forward and create your own key. There is still actually a free tier um, that you can go and, and dabble with. But this is a great way to do hands-on experience in regards to this. And then just capturing the request body itself uh, and implementing that into your own code and, and making changes. As you can see, it's doing the the sentiment on the the, um, the text in that's fact, made available. I, yep. Can can we zoom? Or can we go like just one like just the, I, the screen the right screen? Can we go full yep. screen that? Does this work for you? Nah. The only, yeah, the only problem is that because it's it's the. Um, I text need to be pick. side by side like that, or. Uh, I can make it full screen. There you go. Yeah. How's that? That's good. And I, I want to show the lab uh, on in the, the chat. Side. We had some people say, "Oh, I want to see more. I want to see more." So. Yeah. There you so, go. So, Thanks for the 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 heads up. So what's great about this is that, like I said, this is something where it's a point and click. It spits out the code for you. I could take this code, embed it into uh, Visual Studio Code, uh, and, and run the same test. It will come up with the same response as you can see here. Uh, and then I can modify the code. So right now it's going based on uh, the text. And, it, and if you uh, can see, we have text in English, we have text in, Fr in French for Frank, uh, and we have text in Spanish for myself, just, right? Just, so it's not just just, just, just for and, Frank. Uh, for anybody else. <laughs> we, just, we just got uh, raided. I don't know if you're familiar with the, that thing. So uh, code it live just raid us with a party of 10 so our 10 new viewer to just join us <laughs> Fun you know party. what I, this is my second time on twitch i've not seen the ratings before so thank you i am very honored uh is awesome um but i wanted to show how easy this is yeah. in terms of testing this out right this is not something that's complicated uh, I'm very appreciative of the fact that we have these type of workbenches is what I call them uh, in respect to building out of the code. Um, I'm very much a, um, I'm not a proficient coder like Frank is. I'm more of a, let's copy and paste from certain areas and make it work. Um, but this is a, such a great way for me to learn uh, in terms of just the coding structure and how to call, up, uh, call on the API. Uh, and it's hands-on, it's completely free. And the benefit of this too is that when I'm done and I close out this window, it'll actually wipe the sandbox. So none of my data, like if I go in and start manipulating data and I can use that API key, um, none of it is kept in memory. Everything is wiped at the end of this. Now, if you wanted to take this you know, code structure and save it in, on your uh, Visual Studio Code or whatever coder you're using, uh, it's fine and you can use it later, but obviously you would have to generate a new key for your API callout uh, for the sentiment analysis. There's um, different here tier also right so like it yes. doesn't need to be super expensive there's a no. very budget friendly tiers so this is actually the free tier so there is a free tier that's offered the challenge the, not challenge when you're using the free tier there are you're using a lot less threads in terms of compute power so when you're doing your analysis obviously we're doing three lines here you can do it on the free tier pretty quickly if you're doing a, a 2000 page uh, document 
Yeah, right? So what, what happened is a 2,000-page document might take you a couple hours to go through a sentiment analysis of the document. Yeah, but then, right? like, it's free. But it's free. If you just want right? to know, oh, like, is it worth it, or time, or whatever, use that, you, you know put that something quickly you try it even if it takes three I, hours okay that's cool now like you know maybe i could uh, think about spending more bucks on it and having having it faster if it's worth it if it's worth it right it all depends on value um the biggest thing with this on social media is that you need instant uh responses to information right yeah. so Especially when a when a child's life is in danger. Well, I, I, in that have, context, oh, of course. Hundred percent. No, no, hundred percent. But it, and I wanted to show just you know from a free perspective, it's pretty robust, right? You can do a lot. It's not that you can't do a lot. Um, the benefit of doing it this way through Learn is that I don't have to set up an Azure account, right? If I'm new to Azure, I haven't dabbled with Azure yet. You're I want to test out the through Learn. Learn. Like, it's a perfect way to do it, right? Uh, and the URLs for all these labs uh, are also made available in, in the subject text that Frank shared with, with everybody. So that's pretty cool. Let me get out of this guy and go back to desktop number one. Uh, all right. So the one thing I want everybody to take into consideration, and this is something that we learned very quickly um, on the Missing Children Project, was you can connect everything in the sun. You can capture information from social platforms, you can connect information from uh, individuals, you can connect information from items. Um, I know of one project where it's monitoring cows to understand when is the best time to milk the cow, right? Like it'll have a collar around their neck and measure, measures their temperature. And when it's at a certain temperature is the best time to milk said cow. And the, you know, the, the, the question though is why? Why do you want to do that? What are you trying to accomplish? And who does it uh, impact when you capture this information? We forget about this a lot in terms of the essential relationship. It's not enough just to capture the information. This is what we learned like doing the Missing Children Project. You must have the buy-in and collaboration with the business decision maker, those that sign the checks of the organization that you support or that you are working on behalf of. Um, operations. Is it secure in terms of the solution that you're putting forward? Is it, you know, is it something that meets the organization's needs from an architectural uh, standpoint? And then obviously the developer as well in terms of coding out the information. No solution will be a, a valid solution or a working solution unless these three parties are working in collaboration on behalf of the organization they support to build out the solution. I've seen so many horror stories where, oh yeah, we're just going to implement this and I'm not going to worry about security or I'm not going to worry about the bottom line. It's, it's, it's important to the business. It's, it doesn't matter how much it's going to cost. We're going to get this done. And it would just fall flat on its face or the business decision maker gets this bill that's thousands of dollars and they freak out saying, what is this? I didn't approve this. Why are we going to build this? Very important that you have this relationship and an establishment. In regards to the Missing Children Project, we were actually able to grab information within seven minutes back then uh, of all the information on the child, including sentiment analysis of the conversations that the child was having with certain individuals. What we didn't know, and at that time we hadn't, we hadn't included the, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, is that there are laws in regards to the way that you capture information. Even though the, inf though the information is being offered up as public on a social media platform, you still require permission from either the child or from the legal guardian uh, in respect to capturing that information for sentiment analysis. And so that's why the portal was designed so that the, the child or the parent would log in and allow the solution to have access to the social media platform to gain access to those accounts. Now, it did lengthen the process from seven, uh, seven minutes to about 24 hours. However, it's still quicker than the 30 days it would take originally. Um, this, you know, and this is where we established this, you know, essential relationship uh, um, diagram in respect to make sure that all parties are aware in terms of what you're trying to build out and that everybody is, has bought in uh, or else, you know, all the work that you've done for the solution that you build out is for naught. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't impact anybody or it doesn't impact the bottom line or cost more money or it was needless, right? You got to make sure that everybody is aware in the solution that you're building to make sure that going forward, this is something that's going to have impact on the organization that you support. So let's take a step back because I actually wanted to showcase, this is one of the first projects that I worked on. And this was something where, you know, we did our analysis. We talked a bit to the business decision makers. This is something where, what is the problem that we can address with technology? What is something that we can, you know, help automate? You know, we did the Missing Children Project and that was a big one. And then, you know, we started to look at IoT in terms of capturing of information, what have you. So 
This was a project that was built over a span of 48 hours. And what this was, it was the ability to use $2 mousetraps that we bought at Walmart uh, and connected it to a Raspberry Pi. And all it is, is when the mousetrap is set off, it closes a circuit. And at that time, that is your trigger uh, to capture the information surrounding the mousetrap. What we wanted to do was, you know, in this scenario here, we had the ability to impact the marketplace that currently was uh, not being proactive, but reactive. Uh, restaurants have mousetraps uh, all throughout the restaurants. Almost every restaurant has one, uh, probably outside where the garbage is. Or if you walked along the streets, you've seen those boxes uh, that are rat catchers on the on the sides of the streets. And the challenge is, you know, the pest control companies are they're not notified when they're full. They actually have to go around and schedule time to go by uh, uh, businesses to clean out these mousetraps. And so the initial uh, thought was, what if we were to automate the response when a trap had been set off? Um, to, to notify the pest control company to say, hey, trap is, has been set uh, set off, it's caught something, you need to go clean it out. And so we built this out in 48 hours in respect that, to understanding the, the just, you know, capture device. The trap has been triggered. You, There's you a mouse don't know inside. Yet. You don't know yet if this, the, the, it was a smart mouse. It could be or... empty. Yeah, it could be empty. It could be the mouse that's taking the cheese without, you know, sitting off the trap. That is a possibility as well. But this is just something that we, you know, theorized in terms yeah, of its yeah. capability. But what was cool about this was we used this as the foundation. This is, was our starting point. This is where we started in terms of the project. What it evolved into was we started with two mouse traps and we quickly realized, hey, we're getting a lot of information in terms of these traps being set off, in terms of how quickly the traps are being set off. And so that then turned into Power BI exercise in regards to with the traps that are being deployed, where are the areas that are getting the most mics? Then we had the capability, then we had the thought, well, if we're capturing in terms of placement inside of a building and geographical where the traps are being set off, what if we were to capture other environmentals? So Frank, to your point, how do you know that you caught a mouse or not, right? Added a camera to show the image of when the trap has gone off, what's in the trap. Yeah. Added the ability to, you know, uh, to detect heat and cold. Are the mice more inclined to be in a warmer area? Um, in regards to the uh, light and dark, is it you know bright or is it dark where the trap is? Is it catching more mice because it's where it's dark? We were able to build upon the solution. So the benefit here was having the conversation with those you know that are, that would be impacted in regards to the solution, getting their their buy-in, building out that foundation of just a simple mouse trap that, that catches mice and notifies when the mouse has been caught, then taking the quantum cells to understand, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in regards to in, um, inside of the building, where are all the mice being caught? ingesting more information in regards to light, dark, temperature, and what have you, and then capturing all that information and using machine learning to have a better understanding as to, this is where you should put the traps in this building because of all the information that we were capturing. Oh, wow. But as you can That's see, cool. right, so this was, we're layering on the solution as we go. This wasn't a, hey, we're gonna go and catch mice and we're gonna throw out AI and we're gonna, we're gonna you know, rub AI on the solution and we're gonna catch all the mice. This was a slow build. In respect to you know, and this is something that Microsoft Services, uh, the 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 uh, the for the facility services are are actually looking at in terms of their implementation for this solution. Obviously, in a bigger scale, they're not using the two dollar wooden mouse traps; they're using the bigger boxes. But the availability of building upon this platform, and this reason why we opened this up as open source, and I'll show you how other industries have actually taken advantage of the solution. It's the ability to build upon um, the foundation of just simply notification, a trigger that a mouse has been caught. With that trigger, can you take a picture at, at that trigger point? Can you, you know, capture light or dark? Can you capture temperature? Yes. Feed all that information to machine learning in terms of the environmentals and the light and dark and uh, how many times the traps are being set off in a specific area. And then machine learning will actually go through and say, these are the pinpoints and the hotspots where you should be putting the traps to catch the most mice. Because of the fact that you're saying that, you know, in darker areas, that are a certain temperature is where you'll catch the most mice. And that's one of the environmentals that I'm capturing from this building. Put the traps here and you'll catch the most mice for you. And, uh, and mouse are are smart. There's, a, there's smart. a YouTuber I watch, uh, Matthew something. He, he's a woodworker. But from time to time, like he, uh, he had some mouse issues in uh, his workshop. And uh, he set the camera and he, he, he just decided to play with the mouse. So he put some labyrinths with uh, like he was putting food and like getting the entry smaller and smaller and smaller to check how they can continue to pass. 
it did something where they need to jump and how far they can jump and they get better it's incredible i will share the link after if you want yes and please. another guy that is also all awesome uh he worked at nasa before and now uh, that's on youtube also and uh, it's a different guy it was uh, with squirrels he did the full yep. uh ninja uh, warrior parkour super so like they those animals they learn also they adapt on a bunch of different well, stuff so you need to you, adjust all the time also your reading right if you watch the squirrel one i what i found fascinating was the, the squirrels were always looking for ways to circumvent the 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 the, the, the amount of running yeah, or the, exactly going through that whole thing right they were trying to climb the poles underneath they were jumping from higher areas and trying to jump on specific you know um uh, aspects of the jungle gym that they had to run through they're very intelligent animals and so having that capability of understanding, well, this is what they're doing uh, in terms of the patterns and then even the patterns changing. So something as simple as the lights in a specific room were turned on 15 minutes earlier than usual would affect the pattern of where the mice would travel within the building. And this is something that, you know, machine learning would have to understand in terms of when do the lights go on in this room and come back down? You know, it, it, it's, it, when does the temperature change summer, winter, fall, the whole thing, right? Um, it's not just a stagnant, this is how it happens every day, right? You know, even minutes uh, make differences in terms of temperature and, and light and dark in terms of the patterns of mice. So, you know, they are intelligent and to do it in such a way where, you know, you're taking, you're taking into consideration their intelligence, you're taking in consideration living patterns of individuals, uh, understanding you know, the habits that occur you know, I, the, we were catching mice like really rapidly and people were taking notice Perfect. in terms of the solution. And that's why, so we've offered, offered this all up as open source as well as the um, the Hackster IO uh, uh, build out diagram of the IoT device itself, which in essence is just a simple push button sample. So it's, it's we've replaced the push button with the mousetrap. Uh, and as you saw, it's pretty rudimentary. It's, you know, had aluminum foil and obviously the one that Microsoft services uh, uh, faculty, uh, uh, facility services is using is a lot more advanced um, but this was something that we built out in 48 hours and was able to, to prove out this solution and it was their first real Ferrari not in just the IOT but also machine learning right and it's that whole understanding this is all the data that we're receiving can we capture more data what can we do with this data how does it benefit in respect to what we're trying to accomplish with the data uh, does it have an impact you know you can you know, if I was to say, I wanted to know of every mouse that I caught, is it a brown mouse or a black mouse? Does it really make a difference? Or do you just want to know that there's a mouse in the trap, right? Like these, these are the questions <coughs> that you would have to go through, excuse me, uh, in respect to what's the data being used for? What are you doing with the data? How is it going to impact the solution? How is it going to impact the organization that you're supporting uh, in terms of this implementation? Now, as I said, other organizations have taken advantage of the solution and it's the same mousetrap solution uh, Frank, do you still have these uh, out by you in, in Quebec? Um, maybe downtown, not not around, but uh, maybe not, downtown yeah. in Montreal. You you are starting to see them less and less frequently, right? Um, I know a lot of people are reading their news online, so you know I still enjoy the newspaper on the weekends. So it's you know I, I haven't bought one from a box in a while. But what's interesting was you know back in the early let's say '90s, early 2000s, these were everywhere. Right, they were on every street corner outside of a convenience store. You know, they're they're readily available. But the challenge is to maintain these boxes. It's a lot of work. It costs a lot of money. And so when they saw the mousetrap solution, they said, "Hey, can we adopt this to other solutions?" They said, "Of course." So instead of using a mousetrap, the trigger that they have here is a scale. So a, 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 a mechanism that's inside of the a newspaper box that weighs how many newspapers are in the box. And so the trigger here is. When there is down to what they usually weigh around two or three papers, they know that the box is almost empty. Uh, they're not checking for light and dark, or they're not checking for what well, do you um, know how to? Uh, sorry, uh, temperature. What they are tracking for is how many papers, newspapers are left in the box, how frequently or how fast is this box selling out? Notifying the person who fills this box, hey, this box is almost depleted. You need to put more newspapers in, but also providing the information of. Where is the best places to put these newspaper boxes to sell the most newspapers? See, based on the architecture from the mousetrap. Better yet, um, there's a police department, unfortunately I can't say where, but there's actually numerous police departments around the world that have taken the mousetrap solution and, and have changed the trigger to be the sirens 
on top of the police car. In this scenario here, what they're actually able to do is track where are the most calls for police occurring in the geographical area so that they can provide the most support. Um, this, this scenario here, it made it in terms of, you know, individuals, uh, police would cruise through certain areas um, because they were told to do so. Now in this scenario here, they can actually be mindful in terms of, well, we're getting the most requests for support in these areas. Uh, and then machine learning saying, well, in terms of your travel patterns, this is where you should go, you know, cruise certain areas that are getting the most requests, uh, as opposed to just driving your normal traffic uh, pattern area. So that police can be more proactive uh, in helping citizens as opposed to just waiting to go, you know, on a specific tour. Um, they can actually go to specific areas that have the most requests. And what's cool, like I said, this is all built off the mousetrap solution, uh, which in essence was built to, create, to catch mice, but using the same technology and even the same machine learning algorithms, it's helped both you know, the newspaper industry and the uh, law enforcement in terms of being more, more proactive uh, in enabling its, its citizens. So the next project uh, we did, uh, we sat down with Toyota Canada and they had an interest in terms of understanding the um, not the reliability of the cars. There's situations where, you know, parts will fail in a car and, uh, it's because of, you know, different ge geographical regions. I know out East where we are in Ontario and Quebec, Frank, correct me if I'm wrong. We use a lot of road salt in the winter time, right? We get, you know, a couple, couple feet of snow. But now <laughs> there's cities that doesn't have that. So you need to, they use a mix of, uh, rocks and, and something else. Salt, yep. uh, Sam? Actually, in, in Seattle, uh, in so Washington State, they use fish bile. So they, they don't even use salt at all. Uh, West Coast cities, for, for the most part, you are using organic uh, means in terms of it dealing with the snow. Um, but they have other issues in terms of the salt water because they're so the proximity to the ocean. Uh, and in some scenarios like uh, BC, you have the uh, issues of, you know, you have the mountains, right? So that pr puts another strain on those cars. And Toyota had this scenario where they wanted to understand, you know, how do how can we be more proactive in understanding part failure in vehicles uh, from around the world, uh, or, or in this instance here, sorry, from a, from across Canada. And the exercise here prior to was, and Frank, this was this was crazy. This was they were capturing a month's worth of data manually in Excel spreadsheets out of 300 mechanic shops across Canada, so 300 dealers across Canada. They were capturing the information in terms of the parts that were failure that were failing manually in Excel. And then they were shipping the documents to Toyota Canada uh, based here in Ontario. Uh, and then they were using Microsoft Access. Do you remember Microsoft Access, Frank? Oh, yeah, I remember. Right. No, so I, they were no, using... No, I will have trouble sleeping tonight because of you. <laughs> <laughs> so they were using an ODB, OD, ODBC connector okay. to connect to the Excel spreadsheets to extract the information ingested into Access, applying their algorithm that they created in-house, which was phenomenal, by the way. This is, you know, something where it took uh, uh, years to get to the point that they were at. And it would take them up to 24 days to do an analysis on one vehicle in terms of part failure using Access. The amount of data access, they would have to choose. Access from. was, and, and it's, it's still good, like I'm making... Still very good. It, but uh, it is, but when you're using for the correct purposes. Like it's not the answer for any, every solution. If it's one user or two user limits, small piece of data, it's cool, it's working. Like it's yeah. easy, you could build stuff very quickly. But after that, use the purpose. Oh, <laughs> like I said, 30, 30, sorry, 300 dealerships across Canada, yeah. ingesting information from, from Excel that was being emailed back to the central office that were then digested 24 days worth of data just insane so they're like can you help us um can right. you stop please so it, so here's the thing right so so we actually had to get in uh somebody who can do uh, the algorithm uh to code it out for us because we couldn't use the ones that were available in machine learning uh out of the gate in terms of the workbench right so there was actual um coding that was made available for the algorithm to be ingested. In essence, we call it the black box, that all the information that was being siphoned in, still, by the way, through Excel, uh, was being siphoned in uh, through through the black box into machine learning uh, workbench. So, sorry, the data would be called in through Excel, 
uh, into the machine learning workbench and it would be uh, ingested into the black box. The black box would digest the information that would go through. It still took 48 hours. That's how much data, and that's on one vehicle. So they went from 24 days to 48 hours using this solution. Now we did this on not the free tier, I think it was two, uh, two levels um, above the free tier. Uh, and that's the thing, right? It, it comes down to your cost based, uh, balanced against, you know, how, how fast you need that information. Yeah. And Toyota Canada, you know, they felt that 48 hours was more than enough time in terms of digestion. Um, but what was cool was that we had the ability to then understand, okay, in this specific vehicle for Toyota, we can see this part failing in, you know, this region because of X, Y, and Z, and this other part failing because of X, Y, and Z. So, you know, having the ability to be proactive and do the, you know, the recalls in specific areas, because why do a blanket recall across Canada if out west is not being affected because of the environmentals that are out east, right? You don't need to. So you just call out the one area and say, hey, we're going to recall this one part because we know it's going to affect your vehicle because of the environmentals that you have here. Oh, so they can be more proactive, right? Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. like I wish they had done that before. I had a lot of trouble this winter with my car. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's it's something that's ongoing. This is a current. But I have, you know, like I at the end, I brought the proof. <laughs> I record everything, right? Because I find out the pattern by myself. I and like they were like, yeah, we don't know. Just call us. I was like, hey, like the car just doesn't. It can start, and then at one point, it just doesn't start. And Ooh. then you wait 20 minutes, an hour, and then it will start again. That's weird. But like, yeah, so I prove how to repeat it and they <laughs> find the trouble and what was they the trouble? fix it. But uh, yeah, so, do but you, it took me know, the full winter. Do you know what the trouble was? Was it like, is your alt electronic. Um, electronic? Electronic. Yeah, the, the problem was like the, the, the car is an hybrid, but. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, you'd be, you'd be surprised, you know, the information that you could pull from the ODB2 and the vehicles these days. Um, I know back when I was a mechanic, it was there were no computers in the cars. It was something where you'd have to know in terms of sounds uh, or what the car, the car was actually doing to figure it out. Um, my 1990 Volkswagen Golf, which is the first car I had, um, that had the first OBD2. And I remember connecting it via the serial port uh, to my then um, 486 computer uh, with this long ass cable um, to, to understand just the, from the Golf uh, what it's doing. And now I have this handheld unit uh, a Cobb tuning unit that connects into my current car and I can tune, okay, this is the gas ratio I want, the gas to air ratio to, to, oh, to turn cool. down the amount of gas that it burns, right? It, it, it's amazing in terms of the information you can capture today. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Like for me, it was just like repeating action and like recording the temperature and different things. And then I brought back the solution, but yeah, like automating the process would have been better. Just like... <laughs> Well, that's the thing, right? We don't know, like you don't know what you don't know, right? So the ability to, to now, you know, go for it. And, and so obviously we can't uh, share the proprietary information from Toyota, uh, but they were nice enough to work with us to build out a lab. Uh, and so the URLs there on, on this, and I'm sorry, Frank, there's another URL I'm gonna have to add to the docket. Oh. Um, but this one here, uh, what this does is it does an analysis. Let's say you wanna go out and build your own car. And so you select which parts that you want to build your car with, um, you know, certain grade of, of chair, like the, the seat that you put in the car. Is it going to be leather? Is it going to be cloth? Is it going to be vinyl? Um, you know, the type of radio that you put in the car, how many doors, four door, two door, what have you, size of tire, you name it. Put all the information in. And then it will do an analysis based on current market trends on how much you should, you should charge for that car. What would be the MSRP? Uh, that would allow you to be successful in selling that car to the general public. And so it's a very interesting exercise uh, to go through and all the steps are listed in the, in the post that you see here um, to replicate, I'm building my own car, this is the type of car I'm building, I'm gonna build a sports car, I'm a, I'm a big Mopar fan, so I love the old 70s Mopars. Uh, you know, if I was to recreate one of those, what would be the cost in recreating one based on the steel that I use, based on the tires that I use, the engine size, you know, you name it, all the, all you can change pretty much everything and it will provide you with the best MSRP that you should be charging to your customers uh, to make your car successful. So it's a very interesting uh, endeavor. And again, to do this lab is completely free um, and it allows you to go and understand, you know, just in terms of utilizing 
the machine learning workbench uh, in terms of adoption of, you know, how do I ingest this data? And what's great about it too, in terms of the way that we built out the solution, all the data and all the pricing is already made available for you. You're just literally um, connecting in that data source uh, from the machine learning workshop uh, to go forward and then just understand how you can have the output in terms of what is the best price to sell your car at. I'm having fun. I have uh, some people saying like, hello and bonjour. They, they don't know that you are also Canadian, so. I am, I am. <laughs> Parlez un peu français. <laughs> All right, let's continue on. Yeah. So we talked about this, right? So a lot of information is out there. There are 32 billion devices connected in 2020. They're all capturing information. What does that mean? You know, do we just take all the raw data and push it out to the cloud? Mm -hmm. You're starting to see this advancement or the evolution of the devices that are capturing information being a little bit more intelligent. And this is what we call the intelligent edge. It's the ability to have understanding at the entry point of where the data is being captured to understand what does this data actually mean? Do I need to you know, push all the raw data up to the cloud or can I create a outcome here on the, at, the, at the edge and the ability to uh, understand the data that's coming in to impact the data and reduce the amount of data that I'm putting out to the cloud? Because any data that you transport costs money, any data that you store costs money, any data that you process costs money. So if you can have a more precise um, data capture at the entry point, then you don't have to worry about, you know, the, the additional cost of sending raw data up to the cloud. It can all just be captured at the entry point, digested, rudimentarily uh, digested, and then pushed out to the cloud. And that's where a lot of solutions are moving today in terms of really making the devices that are capturing the information intelligent. That's what we're calling intel uh, edge computing. So the ability to take the information understand the information that's being captured at the entry point and then pushing out the result. So having a, a rudimentary algorithm that's taking place at the entry point to have a result and then push the result out to the cloud as opposed to the raw data. So this is, you know, the catalyst for this was this solution here. And it wasn't from a perspective of uh, um, computing cycles or the amount of data that you're pushing out. It was specifically because of connectivity that we were required to have this type of functionality. This is the Henry Larson. This is one of the biggest ships that are that is available on the Canadian Coast Guard. It costs millions upon millions of dollars every time the ship leaves. That's gas, that's the people that staff the ship, that's all the emergency services that are available on the ship. And don't get me wrong, you know, people's lives, priceless. There is no cost that, you know, in terms of saving people. But what happens when, you know, you, you the ship leaves the shore and you want to be proactive in terms of the services that are going forward to, to, to rescue the ship. In some scenarios, it's not in the individuals in distress, it's the ship, the boat that they're on has been disabled. And it, you know, in, in it being disabled, they're calling in a mayday, you know, we're, we're in distress, we can't move anywhere. Um, obviously there's, you know, a, a walkthrough of, of scenario in terms of what's going on. But, you know, to have a real idea, you want to visualize, you want to see what's, what's actually occurring. So we partnered with a startup uh, based out of BC, Indro Robotics, and it was them who were taking drones and flying them manually. Uh, these are gas-powered drones. These are not the drones that you would buy uh, at the Best Buy or at the Walmarts that you would you know, dabble with. These are actual you know, full-on professional drones that they would build, uh, and they would actually be able to fly them up to six hours, so three hours out and three hours back, go out to a scenario, take film, of the situation of the, show, the, the ship that's in distress. And then, you know, once the information has been captured, they would actually have to fly it back to their central office. Once they've flown, they've flown the, um, the drone back to the central office, the imagery of the video would have to be annual, uh, analyzed manually. They'd actually have to go through all the film that the drone had captured to understand the situation. So at its most, at its most extreme point, it's three hours out at sea and then three hours back. And so that's six hours. And then analyzing on the tape, obviously they're not gonna watch it at regular speed, but it's still gonna take a couple hours to digest all the information. What happens when there are individuals out in sea and the distress signal has gone off of the boat, but there's, you know, people are radio, radioing in, but the boat is either the communications are down or there are people that are, you know, in the water and unable to speak to the operator in terms of the distress. What do you do in those scenarios, right? And that's why the drone solution was put out there because prior to, you know, a boat would have to go out 
and maybe you know it's just the communication system was down nobody was actually in distress or in the water uh and the boat all all that was required was a tugboat you didn't need to, to send out the henry larson so we partnered with indro to make the drone self-aware but our biggest challenge was connectivity so because of the fact that they were going three hours out at sea there was no uh, uh cellular, cellular communication there was no towers that would be able to you know extend their coverage out to these drones so we looked at satellite coverage and the challenge with satellite coverage, if you've ever um, uh, used satellite services before, they're very expensive. And so it didn't make economic sense to use uh, satellite coverage for these drones. So we then thought, well, how do we make the drone understand what it's looking at? And when it understands that there is a situation which is life or death, then go you know, fly back into coverage to say, hey, I just detected this, you need to send somebody out immediately, right? Because again, when you're saving individuals, you know, it's, it's, it's about the effort. It's, you know, time is of the essence. You want to make sure that you get emergency services out as fast as possible. So in this solution here, what we actually did was we went forth and we made the drone self-aware and actually I'll reverse back for a second. We made the drone self-aware to understand what a life jacket looked like in the water. That was the trigger. So in the understanding of the life jacket was in the water, trigger number one. Trigger number two, because as a fail safe, we had to actually understand that there was a body mass that was inside of that life jacket. Life jacket in the water, it's fine. It's okay, I'm now paying attention, but it's also the, the life jacket have blow, has blown off board and there's nobody inside of the life jacket in, in the water. And so it would capture optically to say, oh, I discovered a life jacket. And then the second step will do an IR scan to make sure that there is a body mass inside of that life jacket. And then it'll do a capture of how many life jackets can I actually capture that are in the water. So one, two, five, whatever that may be. Understanding that information, that triggers it to also capture environmentals. So understanding, you know, is it windy? Is it cold? Is it hot? You know, what is the temperatures? To do a best guess of what the temperature would be of the water. This is all being done on the drone without connectivity. This is all the intelligence that was programmed on the drone in terms of understanding what it's looking at in terms of the scenario, capturing the environmentals, understanding, okay, in terms of the, what I've captured in terms of environmentals and all the data that I've now digested, this is the probability of hypothermia sitting in those individuals that are in the water. And then have an understanding of this is how much time I need to go out and, and get rescue crews out here to help out the situation. When it captured the inform information, it would then fly back immediately back into the central office to, in, or into coverage, not even to the central office, to notify, hey, I've detected that there's four individuals in the water. These are the environmentals. You need to get out there because in 45 minutes, these individuals are going to uh, contract hypothermia. And it was so cool that, you know, before the tape was even reviewed, the drone had already provided the instructions back to the central office to say, this is the situation. Provide, obviously, a, a, a capture, a, um, a, ca a camera shot uh, or photo of the scenario, but also provide the information alongside it, which was a lot, a lot less as opposed to streaming the video across to the central office, which was yeah. the initial uh, uh, project. That's what they wanted us to do, and, and it was too costly to do that, and that's why embedding the intelligence to the drone to make it understand what it's looking at was much more beneficial, uh, especially from a cost perspective and then from a reactive perspective because tape wasn't, didn't have to be analyzed. It was just the one shot with all the environmentals and the calculation for hypothermia. Awesome. So what I'm gonna actually show you is I'm gonna actually show you a demo uh, similar to what we did with the Canadian Coast Guard, but in essence in the same lines. I've actually gone forward and, and captured all the information on the demo because of the fact it does take time for analysis and we only have so much time on the show. But I wanted to make sure that I can show to you, uh, to you, the audience that are watching, what we've done in terms of the solution. And I'm actually going to port the solution out to something else. And this is why I share all the GitHub repos and all the, all the URLs because you can build such amazing things on top of the solutions that we're sharing. Uh, and I'll, it, I'll show you how easy it is to build it uh, once, once we're done here. So here we have the um, Custom Vision AI workbench. This is where I can go in and ingest all the information and teach uh, cognitive services, specifically Azure services, um, what certain items are, uh, what they actually look like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and add images. And I'm going to do this on behalf of a, um, a hardware uh, retailer. You know, insert hardware retailer here. And Frank, what do you see on the screen? What tool is that, Frank? <laughs> I was about to say anything except the good answer, a hammer. <laughs> nice. So these are hammers, right? Frank, how do you know that's a hammer? Because my father teach me what a hammer should look like. I see a handle, right. I see a part that look that I can smash something 
I see the curvy part sometime. <laughs> the, uh, I don't know how you, pop the, you call that. The tail? How do you call the other? I, I usually call it the pry. So some hammers have a pry yeah. and some hammers have a knob. And the knob is to make a specific hole in, in something or uh, to, to uh, bend metal. Um, but in the, the pry is for take nails out yep. or if you want to pry something off. Um, different types of hammers. The, the similarity is they have this you know blunt object on the end and a long handle to grab um, in terms of you know, you're going to whack something with it, right? And like you said, you were taught when you were a child by your father, that's what a hammer is, right? This is how we, we teach um, custom vision to understand objects. We get as many pictures as we can of a hammer and we tag these images as a hammer. And so now, you know, we're going to take another object and this is a, what's the second object, Frank? wrench is it a wrench, a wrench. In English? it is a wrench you got it I'm, I'm testing your english look at that so here we have a wrench right can you say clear mallet say what <laughs> <laughs> clear mallet yep oh there you go sorry i there you go i just learned french there yeah. so key is uh, a, and like that's the a, k key clay key? is the key and amulet okay. is the moving part oh that's cool so that's how you would say wrench. So a lot of people will say wrench because clay mallet is definitely very long. Now is that Quebecois French or is that? No, no, clay, ma clay mallet is the proper French. Is <laughs> proper French. That's, I guess French. A... <laughs> it's not slang. Oh, I'm not saying um, Quebecois is, is French. Don't get me wrong. Um, There's okay, slang so everywhere, we're... right? Yes, of course, in every language, right? Yep. Um, so here we have the hammer and the wrench and this we've tagged the images as such so that you can detect what a hammer is and what a wrench is and this is how we teach cognitive services the cognitive services will go through or sorry custom vision AI uh, will go through and understand okay the hammer has the blunt object at the end and the, and the long handle uh, the wrench also has a long handle uh, but it has you know this uh, apparatus that's at the end uh, that in essence what grabs on the bolts uh, so that's the differentiator between the hammer and the wrench right so we take this information uh, that we've tagged, and now we're going to train um, the Custom Vision a uh, API to so, understand the differences between the two. So, Anthony, can you uh, give us a little bit of context about this tool? Because maybe some people just join. They are wondering if they need a key or something to use that uh, service that you're showing up. So all you have to do is you have to go to customvision.ai. Um, there is a key that you generate, but there is a free key. So similar to what we had in terms of the sentiment analysis with text analytics, all cognitive services have a, a, a demo tier that allow you, and so in this free key, I'm able to distinguish between two objects, right? Obviously, if you wanted to do a lot more, um, you would have to go into the into the paid territory, but if you're just trying to do something for free and, and testing out the, the functionality of the service, all you do is you go to customvision.ai, you sign in with a Microsoft account, it doesn't have to be at outlook.com or at live.com or Frank, do you still have an at hotmail.com? No, I switch it to uh, Outlook. I still have a Hotmail. So I have a Hotmail for when I was a teenager. Um, but I, still, I do have a Hotmail account as well. Any, it doesn't even have to be, you can, you can use your Gmail, you can use your you know, ISP's email account, whatever that you've created. Uh, create yourself a Microsoft account. You can log in for free. Uh, you can use the free tier to test out the functionality. When you want to bump up, you can uh, as required. Again, obviously based on you know the amount of objects that you want to analyze as, as well as how long you want the analytics to take uh, in the free tier here to, to distinguish between the two it took about 15 minutes to go through uh, and I didn't want us to sit here for 15 minutes to watch the analytics occur and that's why I took the screenshots so in terms of the training of the two objects that we've captured this is the outcome in terms of the precision of detection of a hammer and wrench uh, as you can see in terms of pre precision both understanding what a hammer and a wrench is in terms of, um, of um, custom vision service. Uh, the recall was a little bit less on the hammer because the fact that the hammer had a lot more differentiators. Uh, some had the, the knob at the end, some had the pry at the end, some of them were mallets. So technically it's not really a hammer, it's a mallet, uh, but it was thrown in there as a, as a hammer um, just to, you know, to show if, if it's a blunt object on the end uh, with the long handle and that's the hammer. And you'll never get 100%. Uh, this is actually pretty good scores. Usually the scoring and average on the recalls around the 70% mark, uh, which is still good. Uh, and it only gets better in terms of the more data that you feed it, of course. 
um, but sometimes you don't need to feed it that much in order to get that score. We are only analyzing two objects, so it doesn't really ha have that impact. But what I wanted to do, and remember, we wanted to showcase this capability in terms of edge computing. So we don't want the um, device that we're gonna that's gonna do the analytics between the wrench and a hammer to be connected all the time. We want it to have the ability at the end point to make the distinction between a hammer and a wrench. And so what we're actually gonna do is we're gonna export this logic. Now, in the case of the drone, what we actually did was we exported it as a Docker file. And so this Docker file would run on top of a Raspberry Pi equivalent was built proprietary for the drone itself to run the analytics of what it's looking at through the optical camera, uh, as well as the analytics that was run through the IR camera. In this scenario here, what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna, do, gonna keep it open source, gonna keep the theme as open source, and I'm gonna export it as an Onyx file. So this is gonna be exported in terms of the detection between a hammer and a wrench as an open source Onyx file that can be imported into a plethora of solutions. And I'm gonna show you an example uh, here in terms of what I've inputted it as. And I'm actually gonna make it a little bit more robust. Uh, obviously, I'm showing you quickly in terms of distinguishing of, of a hammer or a wrench. The solution I'm actually gonna show in terms of the endpoint using the same workbench, uh, I was actually able to distinguish between 75 uh, objects uh, and not using a drone, but something using just something just as cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to export my Onyx file. So I'm going to export as 1.2. And uh, Frank, you're probably going to guess, you could probably guess what I'm going to in regards to this now. Right? So I've opened up Unity. And I've taken that Onyx file and I've, create, and I've created it as a model. So what happens now is the device that I'm using will pass through all this imagery through this model to do a detection of one of 75 objects that I'm looking at from this device. And the device in question is a HoloLens. And this is a real world solution that's been uh, taken up. Uh, it's in Eastern Canada that they're using this solution that they're actually going forward and using this for uh, uh, search and rescue. Uh, and what they're doing is because the devices don't have connectivity out in, in certain rural areas, the ability to have the device have the intelligence to understand what objects they're looking at uh, makes it a lot easier for rescuers in terms of capturing of information uh, when looking for individuals uh, in you know deeply wooded areas or what have you. In this scenario here, what we're doing is we're taking the model that we've just trained on 75 objects, placing it on a HoloLens without connectivity, based on the path of the camera. So the code passes through the op the op um, the optics that are coming in the cameras on the on the HoloLens itself through the model to have an understanding of what they're looking at. There's the 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 um, URL for my GitHub repo that includes this project uh, that you can go forth and play with this technology. And don't worry if you don't have a HoloLens. Uh, I actually have a HoloLens 1, not even a 2. Um, but it, this solution will work on 1 and 2 and other objects uh, or other devices as well, which I'll showcase in a moment. But I want to show you the results. So using this device, no connectivity, looking at objects, walking around my house. And so here's a video of me actually looking at, so it can, I, my HoloLens is detecting that this is a basketball. And as you can see, it doesn't show it I at 100%. I don't see right? a video now. Are you, you don't see the video? video? I'm showing a video. So, okay, okay, now so I see grass. Okay, it's moving. Now a uh, oh. soccer ball. So it should be looking at a piano right now. Now shoes. A, a piano. This, this now. is good to know. Okay. And so now it's looking at my old laptop, right? So the ability to go around. Well, we got, go we around got a little the, bit delay. Yeah, that's fine. So the ability to go around the room and detect objects without connectivity from my HoloLens that, you know, 75 objects without, you know, pretty connectivity, cool. right? It's pretty amazing in respect to what you can accomplish. And again, this is done through Workbench. Uh, I had definitely uh, friends help me with the Unity code to to put the model in between the optical recognition into the, uh, before the CPU. Uh, but the ability to do that on a HoloLens that wasn't built to do that type of functionality was was crazy. If you can't get your hands on HoloLens, there are a plethora of cameras that are available to you that you can go forward and, and grab. This actually is the um, Azure SDK uh, kit for Kinect. Um, if you remember the old Xbox 360 and even the Xbox One, my Xbox One uh, came with a Kinect unit. You had the ability to play games optically uh, and your body would be the, you know, the controller in essence that you would use to play the game. This tool here is based off that research. So it has the same optics capability as well as, well as IR capability uh, that you can actually go forward and you know see objects optically, see objects via light, uh, and see objects via IR to have an understanding of what you're looking at. You can take the code that I've shared with you in my GitHub repo 
uh, for the plugging in of machine learning, the, the Onyx export, uh, sorry, the Cogn um, sorry, Custom Vision AI workbench, exporting the Onyx file uh, as, a, as a model file uh, into Unity, into C Sharp, into Node.js, whatever technology you want to utilize, using this camera plugged into, a, it would have to be plugged into a computing source, could be a Raspberry Pi, could be anything, you know, an actual computer or laptop, you name it, uh, and then have the ability to recognize objects or recognize thermal scans, whatever that you may be in terms of what you've coded out as a model uh, inside of the uh, Custom Vision AI workbench, which is pretty cool. And that's why I shared the URLs. Should, for the... It's higher than cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is why I share the GitHub repos that I do, because I build them in such a way where <clears throat> it's something where you can add to. You can build upon. Um, I've had a lot of people push to my repo in terms of, hey, this is a better way to do this. And, and I love the open source community for that because of the fact that they're passionate about helping others be better. I am, you know, not the best coder in the world. I, you know, definitely I, I'm a hobbyist in terms of coding. Architecture and infrastructure is more uh, my background. But the enablement that's come through you know, utilization of workbenches uh, has been, you know, so eye opening for me. Uh, and then just, with, you know, help from individuals in terms of embedding code uh, for these models and the outcomes that you can you can create are phenomenal uh, in respect to the solutions that are made available. So in terms of what we did with the drones, you know, again, because we opened up the, the code source as open source, here's a, a organization uh, in Australia that has taken advantage of the same solution. And instead of using it for optics, they're using the IR specifically to understand the saturation levels inside of farmers' fields to know, you know, how, how much water is in the soil specifically. And using this solution based on the drone uh, scenario that we built out with, uh, with Indro, they're able to understand, okay, well, this field needs water. And it's attached, it's attached to the irrigation system in an automated way to, you know, actually turn on irrigation when the soil is past a certain level of, 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 of saturation, meaning that there's no, there's no water in the soil or very little water in the soil and to optimize the yield of crops that are there so corn needs more or less water than tomatoes and so on and so forth. This solution actually automates the whole irrigation process to best suit the vegetation that's there that's trying to be grown based on the solution that we've offered up as open source uh, with, the, with the repo on the drone solution that we built out. Uh, this solution here uses a proprietary IR camera, but you could, if you had a drone that was big enough, use the um, Azure uh, Connect SDK solution to plug into a computing source to have a, a deduction of is there enough water inside of the soil that's there itself, which is pretty cool. Indeed. Awesome. So this is a question I get a lot, and Frank, you can see this animation that's going on right now, right? Have you seen this? Have you seen this before? Nope. So this is when the when the Hololens first came out. It was like, oh my god, this is amazing! I'm gonna see mixed reality, and you know, I'm gonna watch the Super Bowl on my on my coffee table. Uh, I don't have to watch it on TV anymore. I can see it in real time, live on my table with all these holograms, right? This is when the HoloLens first came out and didn't know what we're going to do with it. And there was all these ideas. But remember what I said about in terms of the essential relationship. You have to have buy-in from the business decision maker, the developers, and the IT pros in terms of the implementation of your solution. Obviously, there is no such thing as a bad idea. Creativity, you know, is what you think of it. And, you know, there's sometimes that there are, there are problems that we haven't even addressed yet because we don't even know the problem exists. So in scenarios like this, you know, in terms of what is the future of computing, you know, this was cool, but this didn't address a need. It was something that it would be nice to have. So, you know, the evolution of the Hollands was such that, you know, had the ability to virtualize, you know, the, the you know, instead of using cadavers, you can virtualize the human body for uh, medical students to learn how to become a doctor. Uh, for mechanics, uh, I know the Japanese Airlines is using the Hollands to understand the parts inside of, of um, airplanes in terms of the mechanics of, on how to build and work on that. But again, that's still optical. That's still not using computing services. That's just using visual tools. What if we were able to take what we're doing with the HoloLens and the fact that HoloLens can recognize objects and use it as an input for computing? So this was a project that we built out with a partner called T4G here in Toronto, uh, where we actually had the ability to understand the pipes that are running through the walls and the pressure points of those pipes. So the, the amount of water that was running through the pipes. Um, I don't know, Frank, if you've ever ex experienced a water break at your house or at a, at a company. I remember one time I had a company that I worked for, millions of dollars of damage because a pipe burst inside of the company was too cold outside. 
um, and the pipe burst and, and da caused damage to a lot of equipment. Sorry, Frank, you were going to say something? No, I was just saying it happened twice. Oh, okay. So you have experienced this, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. At one point, they called me in the middle of the night because my... Uh, well, it was like pipes failure. It was my hot tank that broke in my store. Oh, okay. But uh, the store was inside the subway station. So the water was dripping on the rail. So they called me at 2 a.m. to say, hey, come and come and go in your oh, store. Oh, wow. <laughs> so they opened the, 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 the station just for me so I could go. <laughs> it was very, very fun. So this is a solution <laughs> that we built alongside T4G. Now, the, the analytics of occurring in terms of the pressures of each pipe, that was not done by the HoloLens. That was done by Azure uh, in terms of machine learning to understand the flow of, you know, there was regulators, there was available inside of all the pipes understanding the, the water flow sorry frank you were saying something just it's cool oh okay sorry <laughs> <laughs> i should right? make myself so, no it's fine so so you're understanding the water flow that's happening in the pipes right and you're understanding where the pressure points are in the pipes themselves and it does a reporting out there now you would say okay so why wouldn't you just automate this right put actuators on the valves uh to reduce or increase the, the amount of water flow that's going through the, to alleviate the pressures Part of the regulations, and this is why, you know, the business decision maker is also involved in terms of the solution, is that there has to be a human component uh, in regards to the piping systems. You can't just all be automated. There has to be uh, checks and balances in regards to actual humans going forward and, and regulating the, the, um, the water flows that are occurring. Sometimes there was a hatch that would allow for that access to the valve and sometimes there wasn't. Sorry, Frank, you're saying something? No. No, sorry, I thought you were saying something. Okay. So um, prior to, if there was a problem and the valve was behind, uh, was it, was, there was no hatch that was accessible to that valve, you would have to, in essence, break the drywall. And it's happened before. Uh, and that would cause damage and there would be cost to repair it and what have you. Uh, and sometimes they would just, you know, put a hatch in its place. With the hull lens, we were able to, you know, the, the information would provide it to the hull lens to have an understanding in terms of the pressure points that were in the, inside of the pipes that were inside of the walls. The HoloLens would provide you a graphical representation of the pipe layout behind the walls. So you actually could visualize these are the pipes that are behind the drywall without tearing out the drywall. So a plumber can go in, put this HoloLens on, and have a full schematic in real time of what's behind the drywall to, to understand where the, all the pipes lie and all the bends are and what have you. And then, because there has to be human interaction in regards to the pipes themselves, the, in, the plumber or individual wearing the HoloLens, all they would have to do is look at the specific valve. And so if you've ever used a HoloLens before, you, you know there's a focus point that's available that you would, in essence, it's like a mouse, you would look at a specific object and interact with it. <clears throat> so in this essence here, I would actually look at the valve itself and then using my motion, I would turn it on or I'd turn it off, right? Using my hand motion in front of the HoloLens. Looking at the valve and then making the hand motion to turn on or off the valve itself. Because of the fact that you know, regulations require the human interaction, that ability to use the, the hall lens as a portable input device for computing, not the computing device, because that was still done through Azure, through um, through machine learning, in terms of this pipe is gonna have issues, you gotta go alleviate this, this pressure. It was the ability to use this device as an input device in conjunction with the machine learning aspect to be to, to address that human requirement of interacting with the pipes themselves. Um, this solution here, I wanted to showcase it in terms of where computing is going and the fact that traditional computing doesn't mean that you have to have something in your hands anymore. You could be wearing it or it could be something that's, you know, in future just seen, not even requiring an apparatus, right? Um, that's coming. But I wanted to show in terms of these are real world scenarios, real world solutions that we're looking at uh, in terms of testing out the functionality and capability of the technology to advance us to do more, to achieve more, to, to be more capable. So this is something, you know, that then comes up, right? Uh, Anthony, it's great. You capture all this data. You know, there's optical data, there's relationship data, there's, you know, uh, data that's based in Excel spreadsheets that are being ingested into access. Awesome. What about the ethics aspect of it? In terms of the individuals that are in the water in the Coast Guard, are you capturing faces? What happens to that information to capture faces? This is a hot topic, right? Even with the Missing Children Project, um, we have a multitude of countries that are, are implementing the solution. So the Missing Children Project is, is deployed across Canada and across the UK now, uh, Brazil, uh, and other countries are looking at this technology as well. But a lot of requests came in in terms of facial recognition. And that's a, you know, it's a very touchy subject in regards to 
you know, is it ethical to recognize faces? Is it ethical? You know, there's a lot of things that you have to, to take in consideration uh, in terms of the data that you capture, right? Usually when it's a facial, rec facial recognition request, uh, we at Microsoft take a step back and say, unfortunately, we, we can't participate um, just from, from an ethics perspective. Um, it's something that, you know, the organization wants to move forward on. It's, it's totally in their right to do so if they feel it's fit. Uh, we at Microsoft do not just because we don't want to you know, move forward in, in terms of that because it's, for us it's an ethical issue. Uh, but there was an opportunity that had come to us from an organization called HomeExcept, uh, which is based out of uh, Nova Scotia, that wanted to have a scenario to uh, enable senior, senior citizens to be in their home longer. You know, the biggest challenge, they want to be, you know, independent. I don't want to be, you know, living at a home. Uh, so I want to live in my house as long as possible. And uh, to do so, you know, usually you know, the loved ones or families, they'll give them, you know, one of those buzzers or the beepers that if they're in distress, they press the beeper and help immediately comes out to that individual. Uh, if you're, you're, you know, your parents are stubborn, like my dad is stubborn, he'll never wear one. He does, he'll, you know, never remember to put it on. And so Home Except wanted to come up with a solution that could automate the solution. But how do you do this in terms of understanding the living patterns of an individual in their own home without cameras, right? So, you know, nobody wants to live with a camera in their face inside of their home. That's, that's always going to be a big challenge. Uh, there's security risks that in play uh, of understanding every, all the parts of your home and what could be deemed as valuable inside of your home. Uh, you know, the faces of individuals themselves inside of the home. A lot of ethics uh, regards to this. We had a huge conversation about this. And, and the big thing that came out of this was, could we do a detection in such a way that doesn't recognize um, objects or individuals? but recognizes the body mass or of an individual inside of the uh, facility itself. What we actually came up with was a solution that used IR sensors. So instead of using optical sensors, we use IR sensors. And the IR sensors was capturing the data of the, the living habits or the moving uh, habits of that individual inside of the home. So having an understanding of this individual walking through the home, uh, what time they wake up in the morning, what time do they make lunch, breakfast in the morning, what time do they feed their dog, and ca dog or cat, uh, what time do they, you know, sit in front of the TV to watch whatever show they're watching? You know, the whole ability to understand, you know, what the, the, the basic habits of an individual. Obviously, there's going to be a slide of, you know, 20, 30 minutes or maybe even an hour each way. Um, so also building that intelligence. If this individual goes to sleep at 9 o'clock, they wake up at 7 o'clock in the morning. If they go to sleep at 11 o'clock, they wake up at 10 o'clock in the morning. Like that whole uh, capability of understanding of how these individuals are, you know, living their lives. And... You know, should there then be a detection of, hey, yeah, I've been woken up at this specific time. Is everything okay? And that notification coming on that individual's mobile device. You know, at, at any age, you know, mobile device, we're all glued to them. Uh, so that notification coming up saying, are you okay? And this individual, you know, pressing yes or no, right? Um, and then if it's a no, that's the sensor that goes back off to um, their loved ones and say, hey, this individual is in distress. There is a problem. Uh, and then obviously, if the individual can't get to the mobile device, there's a timeout functionality, which should then notify, you know, those that uh, to respond that there is a problem. The next step to this solution was, what about those individuals that don't have a mobile device? My dad does not have a smartphone, does there's no need for a smartphone. Um, you know, he's never dabbled in technology at all. And so how do you make the solution appeasable to them? It was the inclusion instead of the mobile device. Uh, because of the fact that when we build out these solutions, we, we leave them with open hooks uh, into other APIs. We were actually able to connect this at the time into Cortana. Uh, so there was a Harman Kardon device that uh, ran Cortana natively on the device itself. And that became our, our interface. So when the individual was in, um, living up to the patterns that they usually lived up to in terms of waking up in the morning or making breakfast at a certain time or what have you, Cortana would chime in and say, hey, is everything okay? Are you under distress? Is there anything I can do for you? And this individual would then respond back, yes, I need help, or no, I'm okay, thank you very much for asking. So it was that interface that didn't require an individual to really press anything or you know even wear anything. It was just a speaker that was in the home that would be connected to have the ability to say yes or no in terms of uh, if, they're in, uh, if they're in distress. And if they are in distress, who should I call for you? Should I call your, your loved ones or should I call... Uh, medical services, right? H having that intelligence to really interact with this individual, learning that, hey, I noticed you haven't gotten up yet. Is everything okay? Are you in distress? What type of support do you need? And, you know, that Harman Kardon unit doesn't exist anymore. Um, it, it's um, it, it, the evolution of it hasn't come out yet. 
Um, but you know, when we build all these solutions, as I mentioned, these are all open-based solutions. So now this solution is being can be hooked on to Alexa. This can be hooked on to Siri. It can be hooked on in essence to any uh, digital assistant that's in market right now for the availability of this solution as a platform to help senior citizens in their own home uh, in respect to uh, connectivity and, and understanding the living patterns and addressing distress when it when it comes up. Pretty cool, Frank, eh? Yes, it is. It's cool. How are we doing for time? Are we have a lot of questions online? Or uh, question? We're good. People were asking if like we have three minutes. Okay. Um, people were asking if we can find you also on LinkedIn. Oh yes, you can. So definitely find me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, you can find me under Anthony Bartolo, or you can find me under Wireless Life. So three minutes. So we're we're good, right on time. Um, future of computing is your imagination, is your creativity, it's your, you know, what do you want to accomplish? As long as you've got the buy-in from those around you inside of your organization in respect to what you're trying to do. And if you're a startup and you have this great idea, make sure you check out the market. Make sure you, you check out, you know, what's happening in your area in terms of your opportunity and what will it will address. It's great if you have come up with this great solution, but if it doesn't address the needs that, you know, people are aware of, it might be some time before it does, you know, pick up and, and take adoption. Now, with a, a lot of the things that you saw today, and, and I know Frank has included the URLs, uh, but I'm going to share them as well. If you want to gain more information in terms of what we've talked about today, um, doc, docs.microsoft.com is your first stop uh, in terms of all your referenceable material. Um, here, I've created a specific resource for cognitive services for the demos that we showed to you uh, today, uh, aka.ms forward slash docs. Uh, this will give you a full repertoire of all the cognitive services documentation that's available. Next up, I specifically create, uh, curated a bunch of uh, learning paths and modules for you to dabble in, uh, including the text analyzer API solution that I've shared, completely free, uh, all sandbox, sandbox technology, but you're able to take the code snippets into your own uh, Visual Studio Code or, or Coder of choice. Uh, in terms of the adoption of said solution, um, there's the URLs there, and I know Frank has included those as well. And if you want to get a hold of me, as I mentioned, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Wireless Life. You can also find me at LinkedIn. You can search uh, Wireless Life on LinkedIn. You'll pull up my name as well. Uh, if not, you can just Anth search Anthony Bartolo. Uh, on uh, the blog, I have the blog alongside my team, uh, which is itopstock.com. Uh, we also have the hashtag that we uh, listed on is AZOps uh, for any questions you have for the team as a whole. Uh, and then the GitHub repo for a lot of the solutions that you saw today. Uh, again, available as open source for you to be as creative as you want, aka.ms forward slash wireless life. And that's pretty much everything for the presentation today. Frank, do you have any questions for me? Uh, people were saying thank you for the presentation. It was, I really love the HFM project and the mousetrap project, which can be generalized to many other problems too. Uh, but oh, cool. people were very happy all along. Uh, I didn't uh, say every uh, thumbs up, but uh, you could rewatch re it and uh, <laughs> read them all <laughs> by yourself. But no, like a uh, very positive feedback. People very happy. Um, well, if anybody has any other questions, like definitely reach out. I know um, a couple of people have I, my, my LinkedIn inbox is, 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 is growing. So uh, I know some, some people are asking questions. That's fine. I don't have to ask it on Twitch. You can definitely ask it on any platform. Uh, that you feel comfortable with um and like i said you know have fun with the with the repo uh and, and learn and ask as many questions as you can you know i love not being the smartest person in the room i love you know learning from frank and learning from others on my team uh in terms of how to adopt technology uh, and never be fearful to speak up and share your creativity and share uh your part to the solution right it's it's learning is learned best when you share Right, it's it's not being the, the know it all; it's being the learn it all uh, yes. that pushes you forward and, and enables you to you know help others. Uh, it's when we take that that pause and listen to others uh, in terms of what they're trying to accomplish is where we actually learn at the end of the day. It was wonderful. I learned a lot today, and I'm happy about that. <laughs> so thank you a lot, Anthony, for spending this hour and a half with us, and thank you for all of you who uh, spend your time today with us today and you can come back tomorrow same time we'll be with uh, Maxime and he will be talking about durable function goodbye everybody have a good day